Good morning, church. You know, uh, my name is Danny Garner, Garner, and I'm very honored to preach the word today. Amen. You know, it, it's an honor. I mean, I'm, I'm very grateful for, for Joel and Courtney and, and their incredible leadership overseeing the whole church, not just the campus ministry, but, but believing in myself, believing in all of us, and just the, the, the love that you guys have for us, bro. I mean... I, I'm I'm very grateful just to have you as my leader and just to just to oversee all of us and always pour your heart into me, bro. Um, especially on the lesson today about love here, uh, I can grow and learn a lot more about it from you. So, bro, I appreciate you guys, amen. You know, today is all about love today, amen. And, and, and it's been an amazing service, wasn't it? Flat out awesome to see Nicole and Christopher up here and pour their hearts out. That was phenomenal. I mean, I was blown away. I mean, we're, we're entering a new era in the church. And, and, and this new era is incredible because we're seeing our, our young disciples start baptizing. Amen. And, and there was nothing like seeing Tyree share the questions there to Russell before Russell got baptized. I mean, God is, is moving. God is raising up leaders out of us. He's making a leader out of you this morning. Amen. Amen. You know, I was encouraged just about to hear about the quiet time that Kim hosted over yeah. at Utah. I mean, wasn't that amazing? Yeah. Flat out amazing just to see her heart to just pull in all the disciples. She's like, bro, I'm the president over at Utah. Let me tell you, we're going to have a quiet time again. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, I just love the heart of our young Christians, amen. You know, we're the family of God. We're the household of God. And when we open the Bible right now, when we open the Bible up, the Bible opens you up. And I hope you're ready to be transformed, amen. Let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's always encouraging to see new friends here as well. Shout out to Aiden over there in the back right there. But honestly, I'm very proud of the church. It's fun being a disciple. It's fun being a disciple everywhere, but, but it's especially fun being a disciple here in Seattle. I mean, just the memories we have. I mean, the family that we have, I mean, evangelizing the world is going to be incredible. Uh, uh, it's just, it's always going to hurt a little bit when we send a missionary out because of the love and the family we have here in Seattle. Amen. Now, in verse 13, the Bible says, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And the church said, Amen. You know, when it's all said and done in your life, there's only these three that's going to remain. Your faith, your hope, and your love. You know, and love is the greatest. We're going to be talking about love today. Amen. And, and, and the world openly doesn't know that much about love. They, they really don't know that much. I mean, there's thousands of songs that talk about love. Thousands of them. I'm not going to sing. <laughs> but in those songs, they ask questions about love. That's right. Like, where is the love? Oh, yeah. right? Right? I mean, obviously, obviously, Black Eyed Peas, love is found in the Bible. Amen. Obviously, right? I mean, sometimes they, they ask questions and they're concerned about, concerned about love. And sometimes they'll say, I don't want to close my eyes. I don't want to fall asleep because I miss you, baby. And I don't want to miss a thing. I mean, somebody's got to share Ariel Smith about the love of God. Amen. God knows every hair on your head. He's not going to miss a thing. I mean, and I... I can't hit that one. I'm not even going to try. But Whitney Houston, Whitney Houston, 
I mean, she needs to know about the love of God right here. I mean, Whitney, Whitney was on point when she said, I will always love you. I mean, God will always love us right there. Amen. Amen. There's another song out there where it talks about every breath you take, every move you make, every bond you break, every step you take, I will be watching you. I mean, somebody's got to share with Faith Evans and share their faith with, with the police or whoever that group was. And, and, and let them know that, hey, God is always watching you right there. Amen. But, but the world is lost seeking to find love in all the wrong places. Love, love in relationships, love calling it a feeling, and, and love trying to find pleasure. And, and all they got to do is look right into the Word of God and find out about love. Amen. I encourage you, read verses 4 through 8 for your quiet time. And put your name inside of it. And find out ways that you can grow in your love. Amen. Now, we as a church, we want to rededicate ourselves to loving God. But not just loving God, but by loving people. The title of the lesson today is Love at the Center of Everything. Love at the Center of Everything. In Colossians 3, verse 14, the Bible says in the CEV version, love is more important than everything else. It is what ties everything completely together. There is nothing like love. And we know in the Bible, Christianity is literally built on love. It's built on love. But how's love in your heart today? What has your love life been like with God? Are you poured out from loving people? I mean, we come to church today so we can do better, not just feel better. You know what I'm talking about here? What's incredible about love is love seals the deal. Love, Love always just makes it worth it. You know, I hope that nobody gets... Gets lonely as a family here. Mm-hmm. That, that no one feels left out. Yeah. In Genesis chapter 2, in verse 18, the Bible says, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a suitable helper for him. Come on, Sierra. See, God doesn't want anybody <laughs> to be alone. God looked at man in the beginning and said, Hey, this is not good. You, you can't do this solo. This just don't look right. See, a man don't look good enough by himself. Now, some of us, I hope you don't think that scripture doesn't apply to you. Where you think that you can be okay being lonely. I'm not saying that everybody needs to be in a relationship. Because I know that's sometimes how worldly we can get in our thoughts. What I'm saying is nobody can do this alone. Right. Nobody. And don't think for a second that you better, that you're better than anyone else. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, the Bible says, Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. You know, when there's no love in your life, you must understand that you're struggling because God's not active in your life. God is incredible. And God is the most loving person that you will ever know. Hands down. I mean, the love of God is incredible. Because when God created mankind, he created us with the full intention to love ourselves. To love our environment. To love others. But most importantly, to love him. And the point number one is this. Love God. In action or deeds. Okay. Love God. In action or in deeds. In 1 John chapter 3. Let's turn there. In 1 John chapter 3. You know, this man John, while he was young, he was known as one of the sons of thunder. And what's incredible is this man who was full of thunder. As he got older, some would say got soft. 
But true men of God know that he fell in love with God. Yeah. And he got stronger. Right. And he became the apostle of love. <laughs> and in his old age, he wrote 1 John. And in chapter 4, the Bible reads in verse 8. Whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love. You know, when there's no love in your life, there's an absence of God in your life. And I, I hope that no one gets comfortable being in that situation. I hope that if you're here this morning and, and, and you're, you're feeling lonely and you're not close to God, I, I hope that you decide to draw near to him this morning. You know, God wants everybody to change. He doesn't want everybody to stay the same. That's a myth. That's a myth. That's not in the Bible. The word repent is used throughout the Bible, even in the Old Testament. And when there's love in your life, the presence of God is naturally felt all the more in your life. Isn't that awesome? I mean, I remember the times when I was a young Christian. And we got so many young Christians in the room today. And and being a young Christian, you're just fired up because you love God. Because you're joyful in your salvation. And and, and we, as as we get older spiritually, we've got to remember to to never lose that gratitude. To never drift away from from loving God in our hearts. You know, what's amazing is when God created mankind, he knew exactly what he was doing. And when he created us, he had us understand that, hey, action speaks louder than words. You ever heard that before? Action speaks louder than words, but God's words speak louder than you. Always louder than you. His words are always true. I mean, you can say to somebody, I love you all day. But you don't cook for me. You don't take out the trash. You don't do your dishes, right? You, 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 you're you saying that you love me, but you ain't showing me that you love me. Something ain't right. That, that ain't a real love. You know what I'm talking about? Something ain't right. See, see, some of us need to, need to take some steps back and say that, hey, love, love is not just action, but love is also speaking too. And it's very important to, to match our words with our actions in our love for people. But most importantly, in our love for God. Yeah. When's the last time you said, God, I, I, I love you? Aww. When's the last time? Yeah. Sometimes, I, I hope this isn't you, but when you're in that situation, you got to stutter a little bit. Like, ah, <laughs> God, I, I, don't, I love you, God. We got to get it out. Yeah. We got to get it out. It's important to reaffirm our love. You know, growing up, I, I was in Chicago. And growing up in Chicago, we, we surely didn't know what love meant. Not at all. And, and my family had 14 kids on my mom's side. And my mom was like number 11 or 10 of those kids. So she helped raise like 10 other siblings. And, and growing up there, I mean, on my dad's side, it wasn't any better. My grandmother was poisoned by her own sister over a guy at a club. Wow. And, and she became mentally unstable. And emotionally reverted back to being a teenager. My dad was around 18 years old at that time. He, he quit right after high school. To, to, he was going to go to college, but he gave up his dream just to take care of his mom. Mm. That woman gets older, and, and, and he's literally raising his own mother. Me growing up in Chicago, I never really witnessed my grandmother as a normal mature woman I've only seen her her as a naive child even though she was over 50 years older than me and growing up there I I I had no idea really how 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 heart rate breaking that must have been for my dad yeah and and sadly growing up in Chicago I, I would only see my dad on weekends only on weekends and growing up there, I would be with my dad, and we'd always watch Bruce Lee movies. Nice. That was our bonding time. Nice. We'd listen to Lenny Kravitz, <laughs> bumping some Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> and my dad doesn't sound that hood, amen. But, but, <laughs> but we, would, we would blast those music, and those were my memories of my dad. But my heart was so hard, I never told him I love him. Mm. I never did. Years went by, and I ended up moving in with my dad in, in San Diego, and, and I still had this hard heart. 
in living with my dad in San Diego, his hardest moment was when his, his mother, my grandma, passed away. Yeah. I, I, I was in school, and I get a call, and my dad literally tells me, son, in tears, and this was one of the first times I'd ever heard my dad cry, in tears saying, you got to come home right now. See, see, I was in school, and I played basketball, and, and I would stay after school and play basketball as a normal kid who loves basketball would do. And, and my friends take me home, and there's nothing but cops in the, in the apartment complex. He didn't tell me what happened. And I see a body bag, and my grandmother's in that body bag. See, my dad had came home from work because he had a bad feeling. And he went into my grandmother's apartment. We lived in a separate apartment, and she was on dialysis. But he came home and saw the whole carpet just covered in blood. Wow. And her just dead on the floor. Wow. And I walked home and, 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 and after getting dropped off, and I saw my dad just in tears. And I, I held my dad, and, and, and everything in me wanted to tell my dad I love him. But I didn't. Mm -hmm. I didn't. My heart was that hard mm -hmm. growing up in what I experienced in Chicago. And I remember years later, studying the Bible, becoming a disciple. And I, I remember that time. And I told, I told myself, I need to repent. Mm -hmm. Come on. I, I need to repent. And I called my dad on the phone and I, in, in tears. And I said, Dad, I'm so sorry. I should have been there. I should have been, I should have been your loving son. And I should have told you I love you. But dad, right now, I love you. Come on. My dad was so moved in his heart, he didn't know what to say. Because <laughs> it was a random Tuesday. <laughs> at like three in, the morning, three in the afternoon. And he's just sitting at work like, I love you too, son. That was, that was a 20-year-old man. For 20 years, my heart was that hard. But sadly, I know I'm not the only one. I know I'm not the only one. Brothers and sisters, we need to reaffirm our love for God. Because my, my perception of my daddy became my perception of my father. And, and I, I didn't feel comfortable telling God that I loved him. Let that not be us today. Yeah. Let that not be you right now. See, right now as a family, I want to encourage you. Tell God right now you love him. I love God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. Amen. Amen. You know, God's love is incredible because he gave his only son for you, for each of you. That's the love of God. He was willing to sacrifice everything just so he can have your soul just so you would love him right on back. And there will never be a comparison between us and God's love. It will never be comparable. But all we can do is reaffirm our love right on back at him. So brothers and sisters, to, to love God is to obey his commands. And, and I want to encourage you, focus in on your obedience. What are the areas in your life where you're struggling in obeying God? Write them down. Start with 10, because there's at least 10, but start with 10. <laughs> Amen. Start with 10. Write them down. And, and I want to encourage you, read scriptures. Yeah. Come on. Read the scriptures. Read Hebrews 5, 7, where it talks about during the days of Jesus' life and his reverent submission. He came to God with tears. Read scriptures about Jesus' love so you can grow in Jesus' love. Amen. You know, point number two is love people by giving your whole hearts. Okay. Love people by giving your whole hearts. You know, in this new era of, as a church, we, we, we need to focus on our relationships. Yeah. We need to focus on the depth of our relationships. Amen. Amen. The depth by taking our love to the next level. Yeah. By, by deciding to, to have a love like no other. You know, we're going to read a passage about a man who knew a lot about love. 
and it's in Acts. In Acts chapter 20, Paul had his heart on Jerusalem. But he had plans to say goodbye to his dear friends along the way. Now Paul knew that if he was to go to Ephesus, which is where he goes here, or or where he sends for the leaders, he knew if he went there, it would have been too hard for him to say goodbye. So he literally sends for the elders to come out and meet him outside. And when he meets them, this is what he had to say in verse 17 of Acts chapter 20. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears. Although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only knew that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know after that, that after I leave, savage wolves will come in. And among you, it will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guards. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. And everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words. Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And the church said, this is incredible. This is blow away. This is special because right here, Paul gives us an account of really what it means to love. It's, I've heard it said, it's better to have an example than to have a lesson. Mm. Wow. An example is way better than a lesson. That's awesome. And Paul gave us an example right here. This is an example of what it means to love, brothers and sisters. And Paul right here, Knew he loved them so much that that they literally come to meet him outside of the town. And he shares so vulnerably the things that he did for them. He shared about every single day. Not just in the daytime, but also in the nighttime. He came to the brothers and sisters with tears. And he warned them about what was going to come. And he took time out of his life. Because love became his life. To prioritize relationships with people. To prioritize preparing people for what Satan was going to do. So he said, brothers and sisters, not only are people going to fall away, but people are going to start their own movement. Saying that they're the followers of Jesus. And that we're not. He warned them saying, savage wolves are going to come in and be secret disciples 
and tear our hearts away from God. Wow. He, he shared vulnerably that as, as, as a young Christian, you need to prioritize your relationships with the mature Christians. Mm. You need to prioritize it. Come on, See, we come into the world or very ignorant, very innocent. Mm -hmm. And the world teaches us what love is. Yeah. And it's no love at all. Mm -hmm. And then we come into the kingdom with this wrong expectation of what it means to love. Come on, yeah. Yeah. And we got to be retrained all over again. Yeah, that's true. The Bible says in Colossians 3 that for you died and your life is now hidden in Christ. Mm -hmm. Colossians 3 verse 3. You died. See, what you thought love was is dead now. Come on, and now you're going to find out what love is from the Bible now. Yeah. And, and for me, I already told you, I, I didn't grow up in a loving situation. In Chicago, I had an uncle. Well, I have an uncle. And he, he has some serious mental problems. He, he's tried to choke his own dad, my granddad several times and, and one time um i was always never i was told to never be home with him by myself but one time i was about eight years old and i'm stuck in the house and and my mom's working she worked at the post office my sister's at school and i wasn't feeling that well that day and, and i went upstairs to the kitchen and I'm in the kitchen, and I, I see my granddad, and he, he goes to his room. He, he loved that rocking chair, <laughs> that recliner right there. And, and, and my uncle starts walking in, and he's holding a knife. And, and I didn't think anything of it. I thought he was cooking. So I, I go to open up the freezer, and he grabs me by the throat, puts his knife on my stomach, and I'm getting cut as he's holding this knife at me. I'm eight years old. And he's just stirring at me. And I'm sitting there. I didn't know if I should scream. I didn't know what I should do. And my granddad, praise God, got out of his recliner and walks over to me. And he just grabs him on the shoulder. And then he, he drops the knife. Wow. And just prance over, walking away. That wasn't the only time I almost was hurt by him. There's many times, many of them I don't even remember. I suppress those memories. Growing up in Chicago, I, I, I can't express this enough. I had no idea what it meant to love people. No idea. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. Yeah. And, and I had to, to learn because my heart got so hard from these events that happened to me in my past. And it, it hardened my heart to the point where I never used the word love. I went to California and, and, and made a bunch of friends and became outgoing because my dad was outgoing. And, and I learned how to make friends with people, but I never would say I love them. I never would. I would only say it to someone's grandmother. <laughs> I'd only say it to someone's mom because they reminded me of my grandmother whom had passed away. <laughs> And they reminded me of, of, of my mom who lived in Chicago that I'd only saw once a year because now I'm in California. I was a mama's boy. And growing up, I became very prideful, very conceited, very arrogant, very selfish, very mean. I lived like a jerk. And at the same time, that was in my heart. But a lot of times people in the world were attracted to that garbage. I became so popular living that way, <coughs> talking about people. I had no boundaries except for special needs people. That was the only time I didn't go there. I was so mean. Yeah. So mean. You see, when I study the Bible, I needed to repent, brothers and sisters. And I'm grateful for Colton Rome, Preston Inkley, Brian Carr, who looked at me and loved me. Yeah, come on. And called me to obey the Bible and to retrain me on what it means to love. Yeah, right. See, in Romans 12, verse 2, the Bible says, you better matter. <laughs> it 
It says you better matter. It says do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You better matter. I want to start a new hashtag today. Let's do the hashtag, amen. Hashtag you better matter. If you're on Facebook and you're going to share some good news about what God's doing as we're fundraising. Or what we're, or God's doing as, as Sarah has come to get baptized. We're going to use the hashtag, you better matter. If you're on campus and you shared your faith with a hundred people because you love God. You're going to use the hashtag, you better matter. When you're reaching out to people that you love and you care for, you're doing your follow-ups, and one of them comes to church, you're going to use the hashtag, you better matter, amen? (laughs) You know, the Bible says, open wide your hearts, in Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. It says, we have not, we have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and open wide our hearts to you. This is the heart's. When you build relationships in God's kingdom, your heart is open. Yes. And, and, and this is a quote unquote dangerous thing. Because I was hurt in the world before I was a Christian. Literally and, and emotionally. But, but I had never felt real pain until I was really a disciple. Mm-hmm. Because in the world, my heart was hard. Yeah. So when my uncle did that to me, it was hard. I, I, I just moved on. That was life. Yeah. But now knowing and tasting Jesus' blood as a disciple, knowing what it's like to, to genuinely love somebody and to be hurt, that stinks. Yeah. That stinks. But that's the calling of Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. That's the calling of the Bible. Brothers and sisters, don't you ever let Satan tempt you to pull your heart back from somebody yeah. else. Mm-hmm. Don't you ever let it happen. You see, what's the kryptonite of love? Ingratitude. Ingratitude. It kills love every single time. Every single time. A lack of appreciation for what someone's done for you will always make you ungrateful. And you will never learn how to love that person. It's a sad thing sometimes when you go above and beyond for somebody and they don't even say thank you. That's a sad thing. Don't let that be you in your relationship with God. Because God, God feels that way all the time. He goes above and beyond for us. All, all, the least we could do is say thank you. You know what I'm talking about? The least we could do. You know, as a disciple, we've got to have the conviction, as it says in Luke 7, verse 47. Therefore, I tell you, whoever has been forgiven much loves much because that's the opposite opposite of ingratitude is gratitude yeah you're following me here yeah and 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 it's incredible because you can look at people and tell who's grateful right like you can look at tyrese and just know he's good right you you can just look at him why because you see it on his smile you see it on his face you can just tell who's grateful yeah. You, you can look at Tylesha. Oh. And, 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 and you can know that she shared her faith with almost 200 people in the first two weeks of the quarter. Wow. Which was a lot more than a lot of people. That's true. And, and, and as a young Christian, just out of the water, you can just tell she's grateful. Yeah. You can look at Sarah. Come on, and, and look at back to the relationship she had and shared with Kim that night. Oh, yeah. And you can just yeah, that they're grateful. Yeah, that's you see, gratitude is the right attitude. Yeah. The most grateful people in the church are the most loving people in the fellowship. It's always been that way. And as a disciple, we've got to remember to, to never expect perfect love out of people right. without expecting a lot of grace out of you. Right. Yeah. So if you're going to expect much out of the people, you better have a lot of grace in your heart. Right? Right. It's not fair. That's what God does for us. And that's how we should imitate God in our relationships with each other. But with God, we can always expect unfailing love from him. I mean, when a brother or sister hurts you, God forbid you take it personally. 
But if you did, you better go and you better go and pray to that unfailing love that God has. And, and, and you better go to God and God will encourage you right on back. So you know how to deal with that solution in that situation the right way. Amen. Don't waste time wrestling with yourself when all you need to do is go to God in the first place. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your time. Don't even try to process it. <laughs> Don't even try. Like, uh, did, did this person just slap me? I don't know if you've ever been there. I don't know if you've ever been there. I, I've actually been there, sadly. And you got to think, like, what just happened? Don't, don't even think what just happened. Think about God. The love of God. Amen. I want to give you some practicals. Okay. Because I believe the church needs to grow in these areas. The church, we need to grow in loving as a young disciple, the more mature disciples. And, and, the, and the mature disciples need to learn how to love the baby disciples. So I have practicals for each. If you're a young Christian that just gotten baptized, four practicals. Spend the night with the disciples who baptize you. Spend the night at their house. Go and hang out with them. Have a sleepover. Amen. Go back to your young days, amen, when love was pure. Number two, ask to hear their testimony. Nice. Ask to hear their testimony. Number three, share your testimony. <laughs> <laughs> and number four, have meals together. If, if it's within your means, feed them. Take your disciple to dinner. Even if it's off your husky card, amen. <laughs> but do it. Yep. Reaffirm your love for your disciples, amen. Nice. Now, disciples, this one's for you. Be intentional. Yeah. That's awesome. Love it. Be intentional. Come on. If it's in the fellowship and there's something you know you need to bring up, bring it up in the fellowship, but pull it away. Pull it outside. Be intentional, amen. amen. Think through what you need to do before you get to where you need to be. Yeah. Be That's intentional. Good. Have a plan. Have a to-do list. Mm-hmm. Amen? Amen. Seasoned veterans, we need to have seasoned conversations. Nice. Seasoned with salt. Have conversations that build up the people around you, not tearing them down. Amen? These are areas I believe if we do, God will blow us away. As a church today, we're at 30, we're, our call is to be at 30%. With special missions. Okay. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. And, and special missions is awesome. For time, I'm not going to read the scripture, but you can write it down. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7 through 8. And it talks about excelling in the grace of giving as this is a test of your true love for each other. Nice. And, and, and we're going to close here in John chapter 13. Come on, but many of us can quote it, so I'm just going to quote it now. In John 13, the Bible says, a new command I give you. Love one another. By this, all, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. God is awesome. God is awesome, but God is also a what have you done for me lately kind of God. So I want to encourage you, if you're struggling in your love for each other, if you're struggling in your love for the family, your love for God, always remember that God's unfailing love will never fail you. That's why it's called unfailing. And, And remember these two points, love God, number one, and love people, number two, and watch God be glorified through you and to God be all the glory.